Hello and welcome. It looks like it's been over a month since we've made a video. You can see I have a new network analyzer. This is the Light VNA. You can see this has the 4 inch display. You can see the frequency range on this is 50 kilohertz to 6.3 gigahertz. When I saw the initial release for this, I talked to my buddy Flipper and we ended up buying two of these. I've conducted a few tests on this and I've been posting the data up on the EV blog. I'll provide a link to that in the description. We're going to be using this pencil as part of my testing of the Light VNA4. You can see this is a Dilbert comic strip pencil. So the other day I kicked on YouTube and it came up with a recommended video that I decided to watch. And I perked up on a couple of things that were mentioned. And I'd like to go over those in this video. So here are the clips that I'm referencing. Now on the, the H and the H4, the output of the device is not a pure, nice, clean RF sinusoid. It's actually a square wave. That's actually what it looks like on a scope, okay? It's about a 600 millivolt peak-to-peak -peak square wave into 50 ohms. So, well, you say, why do I have to worry about that? Well, look at the device you're testing. Will the device you're testing have a problem with the fact that the input is actually a square wave? It has spectral content other than the frequency that you actually want to measure. You have to, might have to consider that, especially if it's a homebrew circuit or something. The V2 unit does use a sinusoidal output, so it doesn't have these problems with using harmonics. It actually uses a fundamental, you know, pretty, pretty decent looking sine wave, still not perfect, but it is a sinusoidal output over the whole frequency range. Um, the V2 uh, plus four goes up to four gigahertz and it's a sinusoid all the way up. So, uh, so that's good to know. So again, these, these limitations are primarily on the, the little inexpensive, you know, $50 units. Can nano VNA be used as a signal generator producing a sine wave without harmonics or an output connector? And if so, what is the maximum frequency? Um, the inexpensive H and H4, the output's a square wave, so you'd have to put your own low-pass filter on it if you want to use it as a continuous device. Um, and then, so you might say, well, then the, the V2 plus 4 might be a good one, because that gives you a sinusoidal output. All right, so we've got our oscilloscope out. And we're just going to take a piece of cable, connect it to channel 1. The scope is set for 50 ohm termination, and it's 100 millivolts per division. Of course, this is DC coupled. So here I have our original Nano VNA. What I'm going to do is select Stimulus and CW frequency and let's just set this for 10 megahertz and you can see just like the video mentions this is obviously a square wave what we can do is take this on up in frequency so let's go to 100 megahertz and you can see again a little rounded but obviously a square wave so now let's have a look at the V2 plus 4 Again, from that video, he's claiming that this output's a sine wave. And he also claims that it does it over the entire working range. Again, we're just going to select stimulus. And we'll select CW frequency. And let's select 1 megahertz. It doesn't look like a sine wave. As a matter of fact, we can do measure. And let's do standard horizontal. And we can see it has a rise time of roughly 3.9 nanoseconds and a fall time of roughly 4 nanoseconds. Of course, this V2 plus 4 has two synthesizers. So let's go ahead and we'll change the CW frequency to 160 megahertz. And let's go ahead and zoom in with our scope. We can see both the rise and the fall time for this is roughly 500 picoseconds. Let's go ahead and we'll increase the frequency a little further. So CW and we'll go to 300 megahertz. Now again, one thing to remember, this oscilloscope only has a bandwidth of 600 megahertz. Normally to look at a waveform like this, we'd use my old LaCroix WaveMaster. Even my first DSO, the LaCroix 7200 would be perfect for this. Both of those scopes would probably show us a better representation of what this edge looks like. So here we have the light VNA. Again, we'll just go to Stimulus, and we'll select CW, and again, 1 megahertz. Let's go ahead and attach our scope to port 1. And again, we can see it's outputting a square wave. 
again let's go ahead and we'll change our CW frequency to 160 megahertz and let's go ahead and zoom in and again we can see it's a square wave drive so I'm not really sure why they were suggesting that the V2 plus 4 is a sine wave drive obviously it's not and neither is the light VNA as a matter of fact I haven't seen any of these low-cost VNAs with a sine wave drive so when I played that section of video there was something else that he brought up that I thought was quite interesting let me just go ahead and play that segment one more time will the device you're testing have a problem with the fact that the input is actually a square wave and has spectral content other than the frequency that you actually want to measure you have to might have to consider that especially if it's a homebrew circuit or something so of course what he's talking about is the fact that these low-cost VNAs put out a square wave drive and that those could have some interaction with the circuit that you're testing. If you've watched my videos, you've seen me run a lot of demonstrations with these VNAs. As a matter of fact, these are some of the test boards that I've put together that I've shown during some of these videos. Now again, I own some old vintage network analyzers and I've compared the results from these low-cost network analyzers against my other VNAs and we get very comparable results. And of course, during a lot of my demonstrations, I'm just looking at passive components, but we have looked at active components as well. So what I'd like to do is demonstrate a circuit that would have a problem with all these low-cost network analyzers, but if we run it on any of my vintage HP network analyzers, it's not going to have any problem at all. So here's the circuit in question. I built this just for this demonstration, and in the start of the video, I mentioned that we we're going to be using this Dilbert pencil as part of my testing of the light VNA. So the reason that we're using this is I needed some custom inductors and the diameter of this pencil happens to be 0.3 inches and I use this as my coil form to wind those inductors. So that's where this pencil comes in. So let's go ahead we'll set this up on one of our network analyzers and have a look at it. Here are my three vintage network analyzers. We're going to start with the HP 3589A. This is a network slash spectrum analyzer. We can use this network analyzer to look at S11. To do that requires that we add an external coupler. It has software built into it to perform the calibration. Unfortunately, the only way to make that work is it identifies the test set that's attached to it. I don't have one of those. But my software that I use for these low-cost network analyzer supports this network analyzer as well. So what we're going to do is we're just going to attach a BNC to BNC. That's going to be our through. So what we're going to do is select the measurement type. And we're going to select the uh, swept network analyzer. And of course this is sweeping over the entire frequency range right now. Let's go ahead and we'll set a start frequency of 50 kilohertz and a stop frequency of 1 megahertz. And you can see, boy, this thing's already very flat. We haven't even normalized the data. I'll go ahead and do that though. We can just do measurement type and calibrate and normalize through. It's not going to matter much. We'll gain a couple of tenths of a dB flatness. Now let's go ahead and connect our device under test. And you can see this is reading roughly 16.6 .6 dB down. So let's go ahead and power it up. There you go. It's not quite so flat. We can go ahead and zoom in on this. We'll just hit scale and auto scale. We can see at 50 kilohertz we're starting off at roughly 16.6 .6 dB. And it's got this nice gradual slope down to roughly 18.31 dB at 1 megahertz. And this is looking at the software for the 3589A. Again, that thing's starting to warm up, but you can see it's going from roughly 16.24 now down to 17.73. You can hear the network analyzer in the background starting to calibrate as it's warming up. Let's go ahead and try this same test with the old PNA. Now, unfortunately, this PNA can only run down to 300 kilohertz. Now, again, because we're working at such low frequencies, calibration on this PNA isn't very critical. So we're just using our homemade standards. 
and you can see I have a BNC to SMA adapter that I'm using to adapt to the standard and again we're just using our BNC to BNC for our through so this is looking at our software you can see with the through attached we're very close to 50 ohms let's go ahead and we'll remove the through and you can see it displays an open let's go ahead now and we'll attach our load and you can see the input of this is very close to 50 ohms and let's go ahead and change it to transmission mode and again we can see it's very close to 16 db so now let's go ahead and we'll power it up and we can see at about 300 kilohertz we're at about 17 and a half db down and it gradually decreases down to 18.3 db at a megahertz and we can also see if we're looking at s11 again basically we end up with a dot in the center at 51 ohms now let's go ahead and attach this up to the nano bna we're going to start with the b2 plus 4 i've calibrated this for 50 kilohertz to 1 megahertz and again we're using our homemade standards for this you can see as i remove the through we get our open let's go ahead and we'll install our bnc adapters again at these low frequencies it's not critical that we torque them Let's unpower the circuit and let's go ahead and attach it. And again, we can see we're measuring roughly 51 ohms. And let's go ahead and select transmission. And again, we can see it's roughly 16 dB. And of course, that's very close to what we measured with the other network analyzers. Now let's go ahead and power this thing up. Whoa, look at that. So something's going on we're measuring all the way up to 3.7 db and as low as maybe i don't know 28 db or so but we can see something's definitely a muck with this thing let's take a look at s11 and we can see even s11 is very unstable hmm. so a few of you may find it odd that even when we're talking about frequencies as low as a megahertz there can be issues when using these low-cost network analyzers to make these measurements. Let's go ahead and try the same test with the light VNA. I've gone ahead and calibrated the light VNA for a range of 50 kilohertz to 1 megahertz, just like before. Again, we're using the same cables and also the same standards. And once again, we'll attach our two adapters to our cables. You can see that this is version 3.0 of the software. The software that I have available up on Git is 2 point something. If you try to run the software that's for the V2 Plus or the V2 Plus 4, it will work with the Light VNA. There are no limitations in my software as far as the frequency. So you could run the Light VNA all the way up to 20 gigahertz if it'd support it. My software doesn't care. However, I did have to make a simple change to the software to support the Light VNA. And it was basically to increase one of the timeouts when you're running this thing at very low frequencies. Of course, if you're just using these VNAs to look at antenna SWR, that's not going to matter. So again, we'll just go ahead and attach our DUT. And once again, we can see we're reading roughly 51 ohms. And let's go ahead and look at the transmission. And once again, we can see we're very close to 16 dB. Now let's go ahead and power this thing up. and there we go again very unstable and you can see once we get above about 800 kilohertz or so it's all the way up to about three and a half db so this problem is not unique to the v2 plus 4 basically what it is is any of these low cost network analyzers is going to have a problem trying to measure this circuit and that's the nature of using this square wave drive so what is this test circuit well it's a small amplifier you wouldn't say it's a very high gain amplifier. It's made to run between DC and 1 megahertz, and it's a 50 ohm system. Now again, let's look at the impedance on the Smith chart. And you can see when this is powered up, again, we're not getting a nice dot as we remove the power, though. We get the 50 ohms. So what kind of amplifier is going to feed back to the input? Well, this thing actually starts out on the input. It runs into a power splitter. So you can imagine we got a resistor coming in it forks off to two more resistors one of those goes through an attenuator so one resistor essentially to ground and then that goes to another combiner which is again just three more resistors 
back to the output. So the other leg of our splitter combiner runs to the amplifier and of course as that amplifier goes unstable that can actually drive signal back through that combiner and into the splitter to the input. And that's why we see S11 going unstable as well. So when we're exciting this amplifier with a pure sine wave, it remains stable. But when we apply our square wave, it causes the amplifier to go unstable. And that's why all of our low-cost network analyzers have a problem with this circuit. Of course, I'm sure that you're all aware that there's a lot of misinformation on the internet on any subject that's out there. And I'm not just referring to YouTube videos. And it's really up to you to determine if that information is right or not. Some of it's fairly easy to discern. If somebody's telling you that these low-cost network analyzers have a sine wave drive, ask yourself, it's less than $500. Is it really going to have a sine wave drive? What would it take to design a system like that? Could it be done? Certainly. Yeah, again, all my vintage network analyzers are sine wave drive, but the used prices of those are going to be more than what the brand new prices of these are. So just consider that. If it's important that you have sine wave drive, you're probably going to be looking at a used instrument. Of course, if you're a beginner in RF, you've never seen a network analyzer, it's going to be more difficult for you to discern the facts from the fiction. So normally I'd recommend books on the subject. Unfortunately, most of my books are on digital design. That's really where my interest in RF lies. Most of the people that buy these network analyzers actually refer to them as antenna analyzers. And that's all they're doing with them is trying to look at their antennas with them. I've made videos where we've looked at a few antennas. And of course with that new software I've shown where I can actually measure radiation patterns off the antennas. But I personally don't really have any interest in that. I do however have some of these old AWRL manuals. This one's from 1985. You can see I bought it used for $12 probably back in the 90s. These books make a very good reference for anybody. And the reason I say that is things like designing inductors, like for this, for example. I had to come up with a couple of inductors for this. And again, we used our Dilbert pencil as a coil form for that. Well, where do you learn about how to do that? You learn it from a book like this. Of course, that information is available on the Internet as well. But what I find is a lot of times there's mistakes in what people are posting. And unfortunately, other people post what they've posted and it propagates through the internet and pretty soon what you have is a lot of misinformation out there and unfortunately a lot of times we as humans look at that as a sign that the information is actually accurate but the downside to having a book like this is you know in 1985 there may be a mention of a network analyzer in here but there's certainly not going to be any information as far as how to use one there are some good books available on network analyzers this one's put out by Dunsmore Unfortunately, what I find, even with books like this, as good as they are, still there's a lot of information missing as you start to look at more advanced topics. For example, if you look at the software that I'm using for these low-cost network analyzers, again, it's Rev3. Some of the features that are going to be included in version 3 that were not available in 2, of course, one of the main features is the ability to look at an antenna radiation pattern. The software also now supports averaging, and it does that with a running average. So... For example, let's say we wanted to measure 10 averages, so we're going to average up 10 sweeps. Well, on the 11th sweep, what we do is we throw away the very first sweep, and then we use the 11th. So we don't have to wait every 10 samples to get a new average. It computes it for every sweep. I've demonstrated using a transfer relay with some of these low-cost network analyzers. I've even gone so far as to make my own transfer relays from scratch. And for the few people that have experimented with it, I'm sure that they realize that I've been using normalization for the through. One of the things with 3.0 is it supports a 12-term model. The only reason that I have the 12-term model in there is I'm trying to do an unknown through calibration. So that's a little more advanced and essentially what it is is the problem that you run into a lot of times is the device that you're wanting to test has different connectors on the two sides. So that can be a problem for using an ideal through so what we do is we use the unknown through model, which essentially says that S21 is going to be equal to S12. Or another way to look at that is if I flip my device around, we get the same measurement. So what that allows us to do is use throughs of different lengths. It no longer has to be defined. So that model is a little more complex. And even if we look in this Dunsmore book, there's a whole section on calibration and vector network analyzer correction. 
and we can see 3.4, 3.1, we talk about the unknown through standard. And he gives some equations down here. The problem that I run into is this book just does not have enough detail. And you'll notice, see right here, he mixes terms. So he's got ELF is equal to E22. Well, E22 is actually ESR. And you see he's got E11, which is ESF. So I don't understand why does he use like ERF, EDF, and then here he drops E11 and E22. In my opinion, when you're buying a book like this, you're buying it to learn stuff. And intermixing these terms isn't really helping the reader, at least not in my case. Now, of course, my P&A actually supports the unknown through. It's built into the firmware. And, of course, that network analyzer is a four-receiver system. Now, of course, in the case of the transfer relay, we do have to be concerned with things like the switch error. So normally that's done with the delta match. And we can see on page 155, he does mention the delta match. Let's just go to 155. Essentially, we have one sentence about it. Well, in my opinion, this should be like a chapter. <laughs> So what I've been doing is actually reading patents and other papers that people have published. And I find a few breadcrumbs here and there. But really what I would love to see is a book that is just dedicated to calibration. That talks about advanced calibration techniques. I've never found a book like that. So while looking for books, I just ordered another book. This one just came in. You can see it's still sealed. This is the VNA Applications Handbook. I haven't even cracked the seal on it yet. I can't tell you if there's any more little breadcrumbs in this book or not. So the couple of you that have been looking for the new software to be released, this has really been the holdup, as I really would like to get this unknown through sorted out. Well, I think that's going to be it for this video. Hopefully it saves a couple of you from buying a product that maybe doesn't fit your needs. So hopefully everybody out there is staying safe, and you all had a Merry Christmas. Till the next video, we'll see you then. Later.